dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Energy Transition webinar organized by the NTNU Energy Transition Initiative. The webinars are organized in cooperation with the research center FME and Trans and are sponsored by Equinor and Statkraft. Normally, we organize a conference each year in March. This year, that was not possible. Instead, we will, over the time span from May to August, do a sequence of webinars in the same spirit and as much as possible keeping the same speakers. This year's topics cover five areas addressing the core questions for how to change society in a sustainable direction. The world in crisis is the topic for today's webinar. After the last few months, this title has a whole new meaning. Some will say that this type of pandemic the world is facing is also a symptom that we are pushing the borders of the planet. Well, focus, of course, now is very much on the current crisis. It will be crucial when society and the economic aspect are normal that we also take this as an opportunity to push towards an accelerated energy transition and increases the measures on climate gas mitigations. All over the world, there will be a number of economic stimuli packages and health packages aiming to save jobs, get the economic activity up to speed again, and correct injustices. It will be crucial that these packages also aim to achieve the core benefits of mitigating climate change, that it aims to support the lifestyle changes, the immature sustainable technologies of the future, and the building of new market, markets for sustainable products, rather than artificially prolonging the life of jobs, companies, and technologies that contribute to the climate problem. I think that this series of webinars that we plan fits very well to facilitate this discussion. A natural follow-up of this first webinar is the next one. Is there a future for fossil energy? Will the future be fossil-free or will CCS and alternative uses of fossil resources ensure a long life for these resources? This is an important question for many, in particular for Norway with our research on CCS and with our petroleum resources. In any case, there are and will be game changers in the transition. In the webinar that follows, we will address technologies, processes, lifestyle changes that will dramatically change the transition. These are needed. Not only are they needed, they will have to come much faster, as addressed by the webinar Radical Social and Technological Innovation. The e idea is that we, through these webinars, will discuss both the urgency in the situation as well as the decision space for sustainable action. From today's webinar, that sets the scene by discussing how we are pushing towards the planetary boundaries and how we need to address this by policy and change, to the last webinar, Visions for the Future. There we hope to turn that, so, that somewhat pessimistic introduction we have today about the current situation into a view on 2050, ending on a more positive note. We are now working on scheduling the next webinars in the series. Information will follow shortly. All of you that are registered here today will get an invitation and also you can follow the web pages for an update. Now it's a pleasure to welcome Antenus Rector Anna Borg to formally open this year's webinar series. Thank you. Dear colleagues and friends from all over the world, welcome to this year's Energy Transition Conference this time held as a series of webinars from today on due to the cancellation of the original conference in Trondheim in March. For today's webinar and those in the days to come, I hope you will bring your new insights and spark scientific discussions in line with the conference original. Dear mission. colleagues and friends from all over the world, as you all know, Energy Welcome to this year's Energy Transition energy Conference, and this time held as a series of webinars from today on, due to the cancellation of the original conference example. in Trondheim in and March. Hydropower laboratory For today's webinar and those in the source. days to come, I hope because you will bring your new insight and spark scientific discussions in line with, with the conference original mission. And our research, as you all know, still plays an important energy role research in has the defined NTNU's and our country's history Another for more energy than a fact century. May be more known to the Norwegians as an example of the world. NTNU's hydropower laboratory is over 100 years old. 1969. 
Because Norway of this research facility, hydropower has provided Norwegian households with clean energy the day since the Christmas, 1920s, the Norwegian and our research industry still plays an important role in the global development of Well, hello, everybody. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues with that introduction from our rector and Borg, but hopefully the main message from her was conveyed that this is an important conference. So I would like to say thank you to her and also to the director of the NCNU Energy uh, Transition Initiative, Oscar uh, Thomasgar, for his very nice introduction. My name is Ruth Astutata and I have the pleasure of moderating today's webinar, which is the first in a series of five. And today it is all about setting the stage with a rather gloomy title, The World in Crisis. We have two excellent speakers ready to lay it all out for us and we're going to meet them shortly. But first, I would like to invite you all to participate in the discussions that we're going to have for the next two hours. And the way to do that is as follows. Now you can look at the screen. You should take out your phone or your uh, tablet or your laptop. You can open a browser and type slido.com. And then the event code that you've been asked to enter is 54. 515. So I'm going to leave this on the screen for a couple of minutes just to explain what happens within this forum because once you've entered the event code you will be in a forum where you can ask questions and comment within a certain uh, length of words. Now the most important feature in this is the like button. So uh, it's there to enhance the relevance of any question and remark. And the, yeah, the idea is that the more likes a question gets, the more relevant it is. And also, you can use this button to help me out, sorting out what is most important. Because if you see that someone has already formulated something that resembles a bit your own question or remark, please click like on that existing question instead of typing in yours because then you will help me not having to read varieties of the same question and also every click enhances the relevance of the question. So I hope we're good on that. Now there's going to be a Q&A session after each speech and there's going to be a panel discussion later on and of course you're all welcome to participate in these. I'm going to monitor the Slido feed, which is here as we go along, so please be free to be active in this forum. After all, it's there for you. Now, let's dive into today's topic, the world in crisis. No question mark, just a statement. And no, it's not the current pandemic we're talking about. This is a much deeper and longer lasting crisis threatening our entire planet's existence. Dr. Detlef van Furen is leading an integrated assessment team at PBL, Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. He holds a PhD in energy systems and climate policy and is a professor in integrated assessment of global environmental change at the Faculty of Geosciences at the University of Utrecht. I will leave it to him to explain how he and his team develop these integrated assessment models and more importantly, what are they seeing when looking at the future of our planet? To what extent are we already transgressing our planetary boundaries? If you have questions, for Detlef von Führen, do not hesitate to write them down in Slido. I will pick them up for our Q&A session with him afterwards. So now I'm going to leave the floor to Detlef von Führen. Good morning. My name is Detlef von Führen 
and I'm working at PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, where I'm leading the image integrated assessment team. C clearly, the world is currently in a health crisis, but the title of this conference originally referred to the global environmental crisis that we're in, as is well illustrated by three recent assessment reports from the IPCC in 2018, indicating that emissions of greenhouse gas continues to increase. The FAO indicating in 2019 that 820 million people still suffer from hunger. And the IPBES report indicating that the loss of, the loss of global biodiversity is a threat to human well-being. It's also well illustrated by the planetary boundary figure that indicates for a set of global environmental problems in green, if the situation would be safe, but in yellow and red, the uh, risks situation for several environmental problems because the planetary boundaries are transgressed, which is the case, for instance, for climate change, biogeochemical flows, and biodiversity. But we should not only be looking at the current situation, but also into the future. And there are two different um, uh, figures emerges. One, on the one hand, the situation could continue as it is today. And at the same time, we have also promised as humanity a set of goals. For instance, the Paris Agreement, where we have promised to stay well below two degrees and preferably even below 1.5 degrees. And the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, where we have to pr uh, promise to eradicate hunger, eradicate poverty, and to st uh, protect the global environment. So a critical uh, question is, what is needed to change course, or more broadly, what could happen in the future? Uh, that is a very difficult question, of course. If you want to uh, answer that in the con context of sustainable development, one would need to know things like population growth, socioeconomic development, changes in technologies, but also political changes, like, for instance, the uh, outcome of the, uh, the elections in the US this year in 2020. But one also needs to know the demand for different resources. But not only that, one would need to know that for different scales, as uh, scales are connected. One needs to know that for different time periods. Yeah, for instance, decisions today might have a big influence into the future. One needs to know the interactions. Yeah, for instance, change, uh, decisions for climate change have impact for biodiversity, the use of biofuels. And one needs to in uh, capture the uncertainties. Uh, for that, we have an instrument of model-based scenarios. Uh, these model-based scenarios are not meant as predictions, but borrowing an, compare an analogy from Otma Edenhover, they're much more comparable to map making, where we have a set, set of different goals and scenarios can be used to explore the landscape and explore different routes and find out what we might encounter on these different routes. Uh, just to look at to that a little bit more in more detail, uh, the models that we would need for environmental problems in the context of sustainability are models that describe the, describe the human system in the relation with other systems. We call these models integrated assessment models. These models can reasonably well describe physical entities, the environment, but also infrastructure. To some degree, they can also describe the rules of human behavior by economics, but they obviously have a hard time describing many of the social factors, beliefs, the cultures, and things like that. And so what we do is to combine the outcomes of models with different stories of the future. And together, we can use this to describe possible scenarios of the future and indicate what is possible and what is very unlikely. And this approach has been very su successful to support climate policy. For instance, the AR5 of IPCC played a major role in supporting the Paris Agreement. But for many of the SDGs, hard, uh, scenarios hardly exist. And there is a clear need for scenarios that cover multiple SDGs, also to identify the synergies and trade-offs between diff for different strategies to meet these SDGs. I want to illustrate this again a little bit further by looking specifically to climate change. And these, if you want to look at climate change, you obviously have to describe the full chain of climate change, starting from drivers, population, and economy, up to energy use, emissions, concentrations, climate change itself, and the impacts. 
Now, if you look at this from the endpoint impacts, there are actually two th major things that determine the impact. On the one hand, it's the climate change, but at the same time, it's also the socioeconomic conditions. If you compare, for instance, the impact of sea level rise um, on the Netherlands and Bangladesh, uh, it's a totally different situation. One country with the same level of sea level rise might be able to cope with it, given its governance structure, its uh, level of development. But for, other for the other country, it might be a much worse situation. And, and so we decided to structure the scenarios about the, uh, around these two factors, socioeconomic development and climate. And that gave us a matrix. And the matrix is on the one, ex uh, on the one axis, it has the climate situation going from 8.5 watts per square meter additional forcing, comparable to around four degrees warming by the end of the century, to 2.6 watts per square meter, which is comparable to the Paris Agreement, at about two degrees warming, uh, or well below two degrees warming by the end of the century. That's the one axis. The other axis, we wanted to say something about possible socioeconomic pathways. And for that, we obviously had to think of different ways that the Earth could develop. And for climate change scenarios, they have to speak to climate policy. And there are two major ways that uh, climate policy might emerge. One is mitigation, and the second one is adaptation. And so we thought it would be helpful if our scenarios might actually address these two response options. And so we wanted to have scenarios where it would be relatively uh, easy to adapt and relatively easy to mitigate, but we also wanted scenarios where it would be really hard to adapt and hard to mitigate. Now in the first situation, if population uh, growth is relatively low, if there is a, a relatively wealthy society, if technology develops rapid, if there is good governance, and then it's relatively easy to adapt and relatively easy to mitigate. In the opposite situation, where there is high population growth, people are poor, people are actually competing with each other, in that situation, it might be really hard to adapt and hard to mitigate. And you can also think of situations where it's relatively easy to adapt, but very difficult to mitigate. For instance, if we would have a very strong development uh, with, uh, in, in the direction of fossil fuels. Uh, we sat down with about 60 people in around 2015 and started to translate these uh, five possible worlds into storylines. And we, uh, in, along the lines that I just indicated, for SSP1, we described the world, which could be uh, described as green growth, with a lot of global cooperation, already some dietary shifts, um, rapid technology development, and on the opposite axis, SSP3 was a world where we uh, described regional rivalry, competition between the regions, population growth would be relatively fast, maybe you could say the clash of civilizations. And so we did the same for the other uh, uh, three uh, stories. And we said that we did this in a, a couple of days and after that, we continued to write these stories for about a year. And then we went to the models and we asked the model, modelers to further develop these stories by computer models. And for instance, we did this for population and income. But we also did this for energy scenarios uh, using the integrated assessment models. And here you see the outcomes for energy, for the global energy system, uh, for these five different storylines. And they're all still without climate policy. And you see very different futures. On the one hand, uh, SSP1, with a relatively low energy development pathway. On the other hand, SSP3 and SSP5 with a relatively high po uh, energy pathway dominated by, uh, among others, fossil fuels. In the case of SSP3, for instance, a lot of coal um, as the regional situation with, the, with uh, relatively little trade forces some regions to use the domestic resource, which is coal. But if you look at all the scenarios together, you see that actually in all scenarios, there's a further increase of global energy use and fossil fuels, at least for the mid-century, continues to be important. And as a result, also increasing, increasing greenhouse gas emissions. 
So again, we use our models to translate these energy pathways into pathways for CO2 emissions, as shown here. And you see indeed that compared to today, the scenarios either assume more or less a stabilization or a major increase. And we can then can also use climate models to translate this into global warming scenarios. And the outcome is that the most optimistic scenario without climate policy, SSP1, the increase is about three degrees compared to pre-industrial. And in the most pessimistic case, SSP5, the increase is above four, almost five degrees. And on top of that, we have the uncertainty of the climate models. Now, this situation would lead to quite some climate impacts, much worse than they are today. But the big question is, can we change course? And to stay well below two degrees, or even one, uh, below 1.5 degrees, it is possible to estimate how much CO2 emissions we can still admit, emit. And for two degrees, this is about 1,000 gigatons of CO2. For 1.5 degrees, this is about 400 gigatons of CO2. And that's not a lot, given this, uh, the, the fact that current emissions, at least last year, are 42 gigatons of CO2. So for 1.5 degrees, it's, the budget is about 10 times the current emissions. So in terms of going straight down, it actually means reducing emissions in about 20 years to zero. It translates in emission pathways like this. And again, we have used the models to design corridors consistent with these targets. For two degrees, it more or less means going to zero slightly after the middle of the century, and then possibly some negative emissions to compensate for the overshoot uh, in the first half of the century. For 1.5 degrees, it's uh, even uh, going to zero uh, around mid-century, and again, possibly negative emissions. If you want to avoid these negative emissions, the emission reduction has, has to be even faster. But we see already these scenarios are quite br uh, a large break with the current trend. We can also use the models then to see how these energy systems would look like compared to the baselines. And the good news is that we can design energy systems that are consistent with these pathways. Yeah? So technology wise and economic economically, these uh, pathways are feasible and, uh, and they will mean a great a large shift compared to the um, energy systems that I've described earlier. Just to summarize across all the scenarios, what it actually means is that above all, there needs to be a focus on energy efficiency. And by reducing the total energy demand, we make the problem much more. We also found out that in the power sector, it's relatively easy to go to zero emissions. And so that would be the first step, invest a lot into renewable and electricity. The fact that it's relatively easy in the power system to go to zero me also means that you want to electrify where possible. Possibly, we also need to develop the negative emission technology. In fact, for 1.5 degree, it actually is almost impossible to do without negative emissions. Uh, and so we might want to start developing these technologies already now. We also need to decarbonize the much more difficult sectors, which are parts of industry and parts of transport, like uh, aviation. And there we need to think of other options like biofuels, CCS, hydrogen, or solar fuels. It's also necessary to mitigate the non-CO2 emissions, which is relatively hard for some uh, uh, sources of uh, methane emissions. We can reduce emissions quite a bit, but reducing them more than about half seems almost impossible as long as we um, have a, a high meat consumption. And um, we also can, should uh, we need afforestation. And finally, and maybe it's not finally, but it should be one of the first options. It's, a, it's important also to think of lifestyle change. And this is for instance, related to the remark I just made about non-CO2 emissions. Uh, 
it, it, it's almost technically impossible to reduce the methane emissions further with, uh, in combination with high meat consumption. Reducing meat consumption actually means that it is possible to reduce the methane emissions. And so far in my story, I've been talking about the connections between uh, human activities in terms of greenhouse gas emissions indicated by the green er the gray area er arrows in this graph and about the energy relationships indicated by the red arrows. But there are much more connections between these systems. They're also connected in terms of land use, in terms of um, biomass flows, and in terms of water flows. And so if we change systems because of climate change reasons, we also have impact on land use, on water consumption. And here again, scenarios can help us to understand some of these consequences. So maybe we can look at the uh, planetary boundaries again. And here I've shown the development of the planetary boundaries between 1970 and 2015, according to the image model. And we already saw that for several of the planetary boundaries in 2015, they were transgressed. If we then use the SSP2 scenario and look into the future, we can see that the situation would continue to become worse for many of these uh, planetary boundaries, with the exception maybe of air pollution, uh, where we actually see some improvement. Now we can also try to, and, uh, again, ask the question, is it possible to change this? And we did some calculations where we introduced climate policy. We also in introduced diet change, not to vegetarian diets, but simply changing the, uh, diets back to a healthy diet. That would mean a reduction of meat consumption. We also assumed a reduction of food waste and we assumed higher yields. And we already can show that we could significantly improve the situation from the purple SSP2 line back to the blue SSP2 uh, uh, 450 line. That's the climate mitigation scenario. We have done this for planetary boundaries and we're still uh, exploring scenarios here because obviously you might want to think of other policies that you want to integrate here as well. For instance, water efficiency uh, policies or specific policies to address the uh, nutrient flows. But um, you might also want to go a little bit further and think specifically how to combine different sustainable development goals. Now, we are currently still working on this and partly uh, in co cooperation with other integrated assessment models as part of a project called the World in 2050, uh, where we take the SDGs as a first step and then think of scenarios that could continue to uh, uh, go into a direction of sustainable development. This is actually what I wanted to share with you today. I uh, thank you for your attention and I would like to uh, also go into your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Detlev, for that uh, very interesting and somewhat quite alarming uh, presentation. So, um, if we have you uh, back on the line here again now, there you are. I hope you're on. <coughs> I would like to ask you some questions because um, there you are. Hello. Uh, so, one thing that struck me is that you're dealing with extremely complex. Um, problems and variables, etc. And scientists are often criticized for using the term of uncertainties. Um, normal people tend to have trouble understanding what this uncertainty is all about. Do you think that using those models that you've used and, and you know, sketching out these scenarios, is that a way of reducing the uncertainties and also um, making this picture easier to see, although it's still quite complex? Yeah, I, I do think so. And I, I as I again, I, I like this analogy with this map making and to try and understand the landscape a bit better. Well, still, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so if we go all 10 years back and we were looking into climate change, I think none of us uh, would have expected that renewable energy or also storage of electric uh, electricity would 
develop in a way that it has done, and, and therefore potentially making the response to climate change a bit easier. Um, so taking it into account uncertainty is important, but at the same time, I think it is useful to uh, take the knowledge as we have and then start to think a bit into the future and to understand what is needed. And, and so, for instance, uh, understanding how fast emissions need to be decreasing to meet the, the Paris goal, uh, how fast we have to scale up renewables, for instance, what, what would be the consequences of a more renewable uh, uh, pathway or a pathway with more CCS. I think those, those are useful explorations. But at the same time, we're talking about an extreme speed which is needed in order to, to get where we want to. And um, there was a lot of yellow and red in those, uh, in those um, charts of yours. And even though you were showing that, yes, things can be done and we can moderate the, the, the pathways a bit, there's still a gap between what we know and what we actually do. Um, and we're going to discuss that later on as well. But if, you, if you're willing to share some of your uh, perspectives on that, already please feel free to do so yeah so um for climate researchers this is also obviously quite um, uh, frustrating uh, so uh, with ipcc uh, there has been this warnings that we really need to change course now uh, to make uh, 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 an effective response to climate change and uh, that has been a message that uh, has been sent out maybe already for 15 years or so and it was true that we have we have made it much more difficult now to respond than if we would have responded 15 years ago uh, but at the same time and the we with the scenarios we are showing and that it is possible at least to meet the well below two degree target still uh, the 1.5 degree target is also still possible but that becomes really uh, challenging um, and certainly, uh, given the new information on uh, climate sensitivity, uh, so models are now indicating that maybe the climate is even more sensitive than we thought before. Yeah. Yeah. So you 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 still, despite all that, you still think 1.5 is feasible because one of the charts that you were showing told us that even the most optimistic uh, pathway was ending up at around three degrees. But that, of course, that was without stringent climate policy. But no, to I, me, it's completely yeah. realistic. <laughs> now, so I, 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 first of all, I think it's really doable, and it would be really, yeah, so stupid if we wouldn't go this uh, meet the well, well below two degree target. Uh, in principle, uh, technology-wise, and also in terms of the, the changes in behavior that are necessary for that, there is something that we, as humanity, could achieve. Um, whether yeah. we get it done in terms of our the organization of this uh, let's see uh, but um sorry <laughs> yeah. speaking of technology <laughs> well detlef um i would like to ask um a question a very popular question from from slido actually um and we're going to touch upon it later on in the discussion as well but the question is short and simple do you think COVID-19, so the current corona crisis, will change the scenarios? Yeah, and I think it's a very good question. Um, if we just go back to the financial crisis uh, of 2009, um, and then you would see that that didn't really change the uh, course of what, what happened after that. Huh? So um, we had a drop in emission, but then yeah. after that, actually, more or less, uh, things continued as before. and um, and so this was a temporary event that didn't change yeah. much of the, the long-term outlook. And um, what is happening now, uh, we still have to see uh, what is going, um, what remains. And so there's much more lifestyle change, of course, now. And are people going to uh, keep some of those changes or not? Uh, with respect to the uh, recovery packages, uh, are we going to invest them in a green way or not? Uh, and, um, and also, how long will this last? Um, in principle, the, the drop in CO2 emissions in this single year is interesting, but it, is, it doesn't really change too much of the dynamics in meeting the 2, two degree or the 1.5 degree target. But the, the key question is how much of this is going to be structural and how, how much is temporal? And I, I, I do think 
especially with the, uh, the green recovery packages, we could make a di uh, difference. And I think we're going to repeat that question later on in the discussion as well, because um, the key word that you were just saying is structural change. Um, seeing a drop in the emissions is expected, but is it going to last and how are we going to make it last and what kind of changes do we need to get there? So another thing that I would like to convey from the audience side, which is another popular question, because um, you had one pathway which had um, CCS in it. And there's a question about this. Is CCS unnecessarily justifying the existence of fossil fuels in our energy systems for upcoming de decades. Can we forget about it and yet achieve the goals? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's an open question and we should be researching that further. I think if we, again, if we go back 10 years ago uh, and uh, IPCC uh, also published that uh, maybe even slightly longer ago, a special report on uh, CCS, at that time, uh, the outlook with renewables was certainly not as promising as it was is now. And so at that, at that time, it was quite clear that CCS would be a logical part of the solution. And uh, since then, renewables, solar and wind have developed faster than before. There is also more outlook on storage. Maybe electricity can play a much ro larger role than we, than we thought in, in many sectors. Um, so, Let's see. At the moment, uh, it's still challenging to see how we can go to a 100% renewable system uh, in, in power. So there needs to be some other sources there as well. And their fossil CCS could be one of the ways to, st uh, to stabilize those systems. There are still sectors where we find it hard to see how they can be completely electrified uh, for uh, high heat uh, sources in some of the industries, for instance. And there, so CCS could also play a role. But but the story in the very short term is that renewables are so promising that uh, at the short, very short term it makes a lot of sense to mostly uh, invest in efficiency in renewables. Then we can see how C uh, this further develops and, um, and whether we how much CCS uh, would still play a role. Hmm. Just a final question, because there are lots of questions popping in, and that's wonderful, dear audience, and, and I want to keep some of them for, for the discussion later on as well. But um, I noticed that you were talking about energy efficiency, and that was actually the first point on one of your slides. And I often get the feeling that energy efficiency is not, you know, it's not that popular, it's not sexy enough, in a way. Um, what makes you think that energy efficiency is going to be an important tool? Yeah, so we um, we run scenarios where we were very pessimistic on energy efficiency, and then it's really hard to uh, meet any of the, the targets, and because then the problem becomes so large that you easily uh, overrun the potentials for different renewable sources. Uh, and the the role, for instance, of bioenergy and land implications becomes really really large, and and so. From the scenario analysis, we see that efficiency plays an important role. Um, you see it also in bottom-up analysis, uh, technology-oriented analysis, that efficiency in principle is often a very cost-effective response. Um, in implementing uh, efficiency measures, um, we have not been as successful most, in most countries uh, as uh, would be suggested from the technology analysis. Uh, so with efficiency more than any, uh, the supply side options, uh, the question is how we, do we get the things that are attractive implemented? Uh, but in, by itself, it is a very uh, promising solution. Good. So I'm going to say thank you so far, Detlef, uh, for our little intermission here. And you're going to join us later on as well. So bye for now, and uh, yeah. we'll see you again. Okay. So how are we as a global community doing when it comes to understanding the climate crisis, really taking it on and acting accordingly? Are we cutting our emissions according to plan? Well, I guess we all know that the short answer to that is no. But this is a complex area. And to get an overview of the situation, we are now going to take a trip to Berlin, where Dr. Brigitte Knopf is waiting for us. She is Secretary General of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. 
abbreviated MCC, and her expertise is on German, European and global energy and climate policy. Now, currently, she's particularly looking into the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And I guess you're all as eager as I am to hear her thoughts on the gap between our global ambitions and the actual results. And keep it coming. If you have questions or comments for Brigitte, don't hesitate to use Slido. The code is still 54515. Now, Brigitte Knopf, the scene is yours. Yeah, hello and welcome to my talk from climate targets to policies. I will um, lay out the global perspective and then have a deep dive into uh, the German case and in the end show the European perspective. So where do we stand globally? You know that we have the Paris goals, but we still lack a lot of their implementation. And uh, when we look at the commitments, the countries made in these NDCs, so the nationally determined contributions, these commitments would only lead us to a temperature increase of 2.9 to 3.4 degrees. So we are far away from reaching 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees. And for 2 degrees, these uh, ambitions need to be threefold compared to the current level and even more than fivefold to achieve 1.5 degrees. So you could say we are very far away from, from reaching the Paris targets. And the bad news is, in addition, that um, the emissions gap, what we see here, is widening, so it's not closing. And I think one of the reasons is that we concentrate very much on debating targets, but we should focus much more on uh, debating measures. What are important measures for climate mitigation? So one important measure is, of course, carbon pricing. Economists um, have argued that for a long time. Of course, carbon pricing is not everything, but without carbon pricing, um, all our endeavors um, will not be successful. So um, this graph shows you how the CO2 emissions from energy use uh, that you see here at, at the x-axis are priced and whether they are priced at all. And what we see is that 50% of the emissions are not priced at all. So there's no direct carbon price or no, no um, indirect price for uh, via energy taxes, for example. What is the benchmark we would need for Paris? Uh, this has been laid out uh, by St the Stiglitz and Stern Commission. The benchmark are uh, 34 to 68 euro or 40 to 80 dollars by 2020. So this is the minimum price we would need to achieve two degrees. And we see that only 50% are priced at that level, but only 10% are really priced at this kind of benchmark level that we would need. So um, we, we still see a kind of policy gap. And this is this emissions gap that I showed translate into a policy gap um, measured in kind of uh, in, in terms of carbon pricing. So um, this was also the debate in Germany and I will now concentrate on the uh, debate we had last year. So it all started off with uh, 2018, with a very hot summer in Germany, where people experienced that climate change is coming. Moreover, there was a debate about Germany not achieving its own set targets for 2020 and beyond. And we had the Fridays for Future movement globally, of course, but in Germany, it was a very, very strong movement. And they also argued for a carbon price. And all this had a kind of dynamics that led to the presentation of uh, the climate package in September by the climate, by Germany's climate cabinet. It had mainly three pillars. So at the center um, is now a newly installed carbon pricing system for heating and transport. Then a second pillar is um, investing in, in measures and in additional measures, um, green, um, green infrastructure measures, and a third part is 
um, on the European perspective, and I will lay out this in more detail. So a lot of um, debate was, was going on um, about whether how to install a carbon price. So you can either install it via a carbon tax or an emission trading system. That was a very important debate in Germany and we had the pleasure to, um, to advise the German government on, on that. And we laid out different options and in the end, the German government decided to install an emission trading system for heating and transport, so for the non-ETS sectors from 2021 onwards. What you see here is, um, this is not what a normal emissions trading system looked like because you see a price path. So the point is that they decided to go for an emission trading system, but start with a fixed price at the very beginning. So this is the time path um, um, they have decided on. You see two pathways because um, there was a decision in September. So the first uh, decision just started with a price of 10 euros for heating and transport. Um, but that was uh, then increased and ran up to 25 euros um, in December. And the December decision was between um, the, the lender and, and, the, and the government. So this is now the straight lines is now uh, the decision being taken. So starting with a fixed price of 25 euros in 2021, um, going up to 55 euros in 2025, and then start with an emission trading system for heating and transport, a national emission trading system for heating and transport, and um, with a minimum and a maximum price. As I said before, so we advised the German government um, and we proposed a much higher pathway, um, roughly starting with uh, 50 euro, increasing up to 130 euro. And this was designed such that Germany could reach their targets in the non-ETS sector for the, um, under the effort sharing regulation under the European law. You see that the decision uh, of the prices is, is uh, much lower. And the second problem is that we see here that after 2026, it's not so clear how this will continue. So it's not clear whether the agreed upon emission trading system will continue with a um, upper and a lower bound or whether the prices will then just be um, determined by the emission trading system. So let's see how, how this develops. And uh, this is the, yeah, the first step in the car pricing system. Currently in the Corona crisis, it's still debated whether um, um, this pathway will be, um, re will remain. But of course we all need that we need to reach the 2030 target. So I'm quite optimistic that uh, this pathway uh, will really come. How do these numbers compare at the international level? Um, so you see here the number for 2021 and here the number for 2025 compared to other tax system worldwide. So it would be in, or Germany's prices would be in the um, upper range, but not at the top level. And when we compare it to what is needed, what I said before in the Stern Stieglitz Commission, they said we need a carbon price of 40 to 80 dollar by 2020. So it's just by 2025 that we reach that kind of level. So this is um, the, the carbon pricing is the core instrument. Um, and we also had a very important debate about revenue recycling. And this is important because um, the debate was whether climate change mitigation will be too costly for the people and what does it mean and which kind of relief measures can be implied for households, for example. And what, is final, what, what was finally decided is uh, that this whole package also contains a package of um, green spending measures. 80% of these spending measures are financed by a carbon price. So either by the um, revenues from the European emission trading system or by the revenues from the newly installed emission trading system in the non-ETS sectors. So 80% are financed by carbon pricing, so through revenue recycling, 
And these green spending measures, for example, include um, include um, um, in, for um, electric vehicles, infrastructure, uh, charging station infrastructure, or include um, um, retrofitting of, of housing, include uh, new bike lanes, include, in, include um, public, um, so um, more public transport and so on. So a lot of um, small and large measures, mainly in the building sectors and in the transport sectors. And in addition, there was a debate about how to, um, how, how can um, poor households uh, benefit from this, or at least not to be um, much worse off than others. And this is um, what I will show you now here, how, how this was um, dealt with. Um, so <clears throat> what are the distributional effects? And here's a figure of uh, the distributional effects in the medium term. So when we have a price of about 55 euros. And this graph shows you here are the poorest 20% of German households and here are the richest 20% uh, of the households. And you see the percentage of net income. Uh, what does it cost? What is the, the burden of the carbon price? And the red curve shows you the burden without any revenue recycling, just the pure carbon price. And uh, the light red um, curve shows you um, with revenue recycling, for example, there are measures for um, um, housing benefits for households or uh, with PAT reduction for railways or also decreasing electricity prices. So um, lowering the feed and tariff uh, levy uh, where households benefit a lot. And this is just a counterfactual if we would have um, given back the revenues at a per capita basis, you would have seen uh, that. Graph. Two points I'd like to make here. Um, so um, there are really lower costs for poorer households. And um, this is very important because this has been an important debate, um, especially driven by the social democrats, but also from others, that the poorest households should not be um, worse um, off through climate policy. Um, but the second point is that we see a highest burden for the middle class, and we still have to debate um, how, how this can be changed, because you see that the richer households are better off. And the distribution question, of course, is important for climate policy. Then the next step is the European perspective. And um, Germany has laid out a perspective of installing an EU-wide emission trading system for all sectors in, in their uh, climate package with implementing a minimum price in the European emission trading system and uh, with uh, working towards an um, alliance of member states to integrate um, the non-ETS sectors into the ETS. <clears throat> we know that the European Green Deal is currently debated very much. Um, so before and uh, even now in, in times of uh, Corona, there are many components. Uh, one has been presented already in February. So the climate law and uh, with greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. Then we have the debate about targeting, ta tightening the targets for 2030 to 50 to 55 percent. Percent. This will be especially challenging in Corona times, um, and the debate about co border carbon adjustment when Europe moves forward uh, with ambitious climate policy. How to protect that? To my opinion, it's very important to pursue the Green Deal because it contains a kind of green investment program, and that um, might also be helpful um, for a stimulus package, to design a stimulus package in such a way um, that uh, we will uh, come through the corona crisis or have a better standing after the corona crisis, but still do not uh, counteract the climate ambition uh, that we have. So to summarize, um, we are still a long way from achieving the Paris objectives, so the emissions gap is widening, and therefore, I think it's important to point out climate targets must be backed by measures and we need more debates about measures and without policy instruments, targets are just toothless tigers. A core instrument is, of course, carbon pricing and should become a kind of leading instrument. This is not enough, but you could say the price level is a kind of indicator for the seriousness of climate policies. 
And of course, carbon pricing must be flanked by further measures um, and has to take the social fairness aspect into account. The EU perspective is um, even more important, more important than ever, and the Green Deal uh, should be designed in such a way that it helps us um, also for the debate about the corona recovery package and, um, and at the same time also not to undermine the uh, um, ambitious, uh, ambitious climate policy. Yeah, that's from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brigitte, for that very precise and clear presentation. So um, we have some questions for you. So if you get back on into um, in front of your camera, I would like to ask you first to elaborate a bit uh, on some. There you are. Hello. <laughs> I would like to to elaborate or want you to elaborate a bit and clarify some of your points and. You showed us an, an illustration of how half of the emissions of energy use are not priced at all, which means that the polluter pays principle has not been adapted to these emissions, yeah? And yeah. are these from the transport and heating sector mainly, or are there other sectors presented there or represented there? It's somehow the other way around, you could say. So um, in these figures are shown the um, direct carbon pricing uh, measures, but also the indirect carbon pricing that some countries have on, on energy taxes and so on. And in the transport sector, we actually see already some kind of effective carbon prices. So that was the right side with this high okay. price. So a, a number of countries have already implicit carbon prices or effective carbon rates in the transport sector. So it's more, um, these were the um, emissions, um, CO2 emissions from uh, 40 OECD and uh, G20 countries and in the energy sectors. And I mean, implicitly, we also have a negative price because many of these countries have um, um, subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies, and it would be very nice and we tried this out to extend the figure towards the negative part. And that's even a, 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 um, a more negative or worse message that we do not just have not even a zero carbon pricing, but sometimes we have a negative carbon price and uh, that steers investments completely in the wrong direction. We're paying people to pollute. Exactly. <laughs> well, that is good to know. Um, and. Um, as you're talking now, questions are popping in, and um, one of them is on the Green Deal. What is your opinion on controversial technologies such as natural gas, nuclear? Should they be covered or eligible to green financing? Um, actually, I would say, um, I mean, Gas, of course, has a CO2 content. So by definition, I would say it's not green, right? Um, we have a huge We're debate on hmm? yeah, less, right? yeah. But, So therefore, I think, again, a carbon price would be very important because a carbon price tells you um, how high is the carbon content of that technology. And in a sense, as, as a German, I, I wouldn't say that nuclear is green, but in a, in a sense of a carbon price, nuclear is a carbon-free technology, of course. So therefore, um, I, I would say, let the price uh, give the direction. So therefore, again, here, carbon pricing is an important instrument and uh, the Green Deal has this component in it. It, it, it says uh, um, pricing, carbon pricing should be um, one important measure. Uh, it's still debated whether um, to increase energy taxes or minimum price levels or to have a kind of integrated emission trading system and so on. So this is still a bit vague in, in the document. Um, yeah, but, but at least as a measure, it's taken up and, and uh, figured out very prominently. And your advice has already been to, to, to German uh, policymakers to, to heighten the, the level of the, the carbon prices. Um, do you feel that the the uh, the ETS system so far has not been successful because it's been kind of half-hearted. It's you know the 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 level of the price seems to be a bit low. Um, it's not applicable for all sectors, etc. Is that because because you seem to believe strongly in carbon price as a good uh, measure, but 
the criticism is that it's it's not efficient enough. It doesn't have the effects that we want them to have. But so your your answer to that is to sort of tighten the screw and say we have to go further with this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in the ETS, um, I, I would say in, um, ETS already is a kind of success story because we see decreasing emissions in the ETS sector. That's that's for sure. Um, I would say we just see a kind of static efficiency, so a kind of momentum, but we lack dynamic efficiency. So therefore, we would say we need a kind of minimum price to complement the emission trading system. And this minimum price would give some kind of certainty for investors how the price will develop. And this would also help us in, in these times of the corona crisis, because now um, ETS price has dropped again. and um, so as an investor, you do not know, well, will this price increase again or stay below 20 euros? So therefore, we, we would say we need a minimum price in the ETS. And ETS covers electricity and um, parts of the industry. And then the question is, what do we do with the other sectors like transport and, and uh, heating sector? That's the most important point. And here I'm, I'm quite open. So Germany has now taken the decision to have an extra a separated ETS system for these two sectors, for, for the uh, heating and transport sector. Other countries are going for a tax system in these sectors. Um, others would say, well, let's include it all in, in one ETS, in one joint ETS. Actually, I would say the long-term perspective towards 2030 should be a kind of integrated um, joint emission trading system across all sectors and across all countries. Mm -hmm. um, that's my, my vision for 2030. And let's see how we can develop this stepwise. It, it very much depends on, on different countries. But we will have this debate within the Green Deal debate and also within the debate of um, increasing EU's target for 2030 to 50 to 55%. And what you're describing there is uh, a challenge getting all the countries to sort of agree on either minimum price or the kind of measures they're going to to, to go for and one uh, question that just recently popped up here is what happens if some countries do not apply the right carbon carbon pricing as well as other measures all the efforts will be wasted how to avoid that yeah i mean there are two approaches you could say um you go only the European joint way, or you start with the coalition of the willing. And um, that's a question um, how, how this will be dealt in Europe. Um, I mean, my, my favorite approach would be to have a joint European approach and have everybody on board. But I can see the point that um, we have different starting points and different discussions. But um, look at the document from um, Merkel and Macron that they published uh, yesterday or two days ago. They said they want to go for a minimum price in the ETS and they want to have a joint emission trading system. I mean, this is the long term perspective. Yeah. And let's see whether Germany and France um, make a step forward with a coalition of the willing. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, I can imagine that Poland is not not very much in favor to go in, in that direction. Um, but still, of course, in the end, we need um, the whole world to, 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 to be on track for Paris. Um, but perhaps some countries can move ahead and move forward. So therefore, especially with this minimum price, I would say a collision of the willing as a starting point would be a good step. Yeah, because we have to start somewhere. And that is probably what we're seeing now with the, the entire ETS as well, that we've started somewhere. Now we're going to include several sectors and, and work from there. Um, a main message from you, as I saw it at least, was that we're debating targets instead of measures, which leads to toothless tigers. I really love that picture. And when you explain it all in your speech, it seems so obvious. And still, we're not there yet. Why are we not further up the road with sharp teeth? I I think I pointed it somehow out in, in my talk. I mean, we have many difficulties. I mean, it's always somehow easy for policymakers to say, yeah, well, we have a target in 2050, right? Because they will not be in charge in 2050 to, to show whether they have really achieved their, their targets. So therefore, sometimes, sometimes targets are important, but sometimes targets are just cheap talk, especially when they are very far away in, in, into the future. 
But then it comes to actual policies and policies, this is political economy. Um, policymakers have to stand um, um, before their voters and explain what they have done. And we have followed this debate last year very closely and seen this debate very closely in Germany. And one aspect I mentioned in my talk is the distributional question. So when energy prices are rising because of higher carbon prices, of course, you have the debate, can poor households afford climate mitigation? So therefore, you have to think in a kind of package and you have to, to make um, a, a, a package so that poorer households either benefits or are not worse off. And, and, and this is what, what I mean by the political economy. And then there are additional special things like for the Christian Democrats, a tax is a complete taboo word. So don't tell the tax word. And um, for the social Democrats, an emission trading system is something very ugly. It's neoliberal and so on. So they had to find a compromise. And this is why we have this crazy system with a kind of fixed price starting with a fixed price and then an the emission trading system. So political economy aspects are important and therefore our approach um, is to, to understand what hinders governments um, to, to implement measures. And this, just one, one additional thing. So we also uh, look a lot into coal um, countries like India, South Africa and so on. And we have to understand why is it not so easy for them to switch to renewables? Because they have a whole sectors, a mining sectors that depends on coal, right? So we have to provide a new perspective for workers, for jobs and so on. And this is what I mean with political economy. So targets are sometimes easy, but implementation has a lot to do with voting behavior and, and so on. And that brings me to the next point, which is to re-invite Detlef van Fieren with us um, to discuss further uh, both of you, um, the, the perspectives that both of you have, have given us. Hello again, Detlef. Hi. And uh, uh, I'm sure that um, the two of you have uh, made your own thoughts when watching the other one, so I'm... I'm you know, I'm pretty sure you have a lot to discuss and uh, of course questions from the audience will still be welcome and they're pouring in and I'm trying to sort of keep, uh, keep organizing them here on my mobile phone. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to I'm just, just going to start you off first. Uh, you've both touched upon it about the Corona crisis, uh, and Oscar, the the director of the Energy Transition Initiative at the MTNU, mentioned in his um, introductory speech that the current Corona crisis is an opportunity to push towards an accelerated energy transition and increase the measures to mitigate climate change. What is your perspectives on that? Maybe we should start with Detlef first. Uh, so it might be, uh, but it could also you can also easily see how it could run in a different direction uh, with, with uh, a strong emphasis in the next few years on economic recovery uh, and therefore uh, less emphasis in climate policy. And I think 2019 we saw an increasing uh, demand for climate policy and um, and so. Let's see whether we can uh, keep that uh, momentum uh, also now in the recovery discussions. But uh, I can easily see it going in, 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 in both directions. Brigitte, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, the same for me. I see, um, I mean, the, the, we have two different futures ahead of us and they are very, um, it, it's like a tipping point, right? I mean, it could really be that um, countries say, yeah, well, we have the corona price crisis, we need a recovery program, so let's start with a renewable implementation, right? Because this is the way to go. But we could also see countries in, in Asia, for example, they, they might say, oh, well, we really need a strong and, and quick um, stimulus, so let's reinvest into coal because we already have it here and, and um, build up the plans. So I see two distinct futures. Um, what what I think it's it's interesting to observe is and, and that relates to what Detlef said on, on lifestyle changes. I mean there are small lifestyle lifestyle changes during the corona crisis now. So for example that we have this webinar. I mean I remember an invitation to New York um, in February and I said well I won't go to New York I can do it via webinar and they said oh no we don't like these 
webinars and so on. And I think this will become more and more popular and this will save some flights, right? So um, flights, uh, emissions from flights. And the other point is that, for example, in Berlin, we have now very many pop-up lanes for bikes because they need more space. We, we see this in, in some countries as well. And um, so kind of more competition between bikes and, and, and cars. So let's see how, how this lifestyle change um, develops in the corona crisis. But at the same time, because now you're portraying, both of you are actually portraying, yeah, it could go this way or that way. And I think in the midst of that, you, both of you, as scientists, as uh, outspoken uh, representatives for your own uh, disciplines, you have a role to play now, don't you? I mean, you could use this momentum to convey that important message of going forward with the Green Deal, um, uh, encouraging the lifestyle change that we're seeing as a temporary change for many, but how can we make that permanent? I mean, are you aware of the important role that you might be taking now? Yes, definitely. So before we had this webinar, I had a short call with the Chancellor's office to, to um, iterate the ideas about recovery packages. Um, my, my boss, Ottmar Edenhofer, uh, has an idea how to um, make a European investment fund that helps to invest in, in green technologies with an implicit carbon price. It's a very complicated system, but um, it, it relates to, to what the Commission will present next week and it could adapt to that. So we, are, we have kind of turned our research um, agenda a little bit and, and give it a new framing, right? So our research now happens in a new environment and we are currently adapting to that. And, and really working very hard to, to, to get ideas about recovery packages to think the climate and the corona crisis together. Yeah, so quite similar here. Uh, and in addition to, for instance, in our case, the contacts with the European Commission and uh, the uh, Dutch government, uh, I think an important role is also simply for the public debate. Uh, and so uh, opinion pieces or pieces in, in, in well-read science uh, journals yeah. And so, at least in the first part, we we, we were already active, and so publishing in, in Dutch newspapers. Good. Now, a question from the audience that, and when we're sort of skipping the corona a bit, um, the time window for action is narrowing, almost regardless of corona. Are transitions happening fast enough? It takes time to develop low carbon infrastructure, improve efficiency, and change cultures. What are your perspectives on that? Yes, yeah, you can start if you want. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, yes, yeah, so it, it's it's certainly not fast enough. Right? We we know that. Um, if you simply uh, draw these lines uh, from where we are to where we need to be to meet uh, Paris targets, uh, we can see that we might have seen globally now more or less as only a very small growth in global emissions, maybe even a leveling off, but it is not going into this steep decline yet. And certainly if you take even a longer perspective back, um, we, we didn't reduce emissions in the, in the speed that is needed. Um, for 1.5, that is really becoming a, a very clear problem. Um, we have, if, if you don't want negative emissions, you have to be at zero in 20 years from now. Now, I don't think that that is at the moment globally realistic. Maybe in you can even think discuss whether in Europe you could uh, achieve something like that. I doubt it, but globally it's not possible. So there you have now automatically a situation where at some point, if you want to reach that target, you, you have to consider negative emissions. For two degrees, the situation is still well below two, it's still quite different. It's about 50 years or so that we need to go to zero. And so again, in terms of the of the, what we could do, this is something that is feasible. Yeah, some, some of our decisions are related to infrastructure and very slow, but some other sectors, changes can happen much faster, like in transport. And so I think in, in, in theory, the answer from technology and economics should be yes, things could still happen. But then again, we go back to the political economy that Brigitte was already discussing. And, and then the question is, can you also see a route in, in terms of the policies changing worldwide? So that's over to you, Brigitte. 
And before Again, you start I asking, Brigitte, uh, I would like to add, because there's another question here, which is in line with this, from science to policy, how can we synthesize and simplify this complex system's behavior in order to advise policy guidelines in the short and the medium term? Just to add to, uh, to the load that you have on your shoulders already. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps that's even the more difficult question. So, so on on, on uh, whether we are on the question whether we are fast enough, I would agree with that lab. So personally, I, I think 1.5 is too challenging, or we are not fast enough for that. On the other hand, what I really see, and that's perhaps somehow related to 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 the second question, um, is that we have a kind of mind shift or shift in awareness of 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 the public. In terms of um, climate, what is happening, climate change, and and so on. And I think again, the Fridays for Future movement, at, at least from from the German perspective, they really put this on the table and and also in a very informed manner. So it was quite interesting to to see that. And I mean, five years ago, of course, people listened to us, but but we were more the aliens, right? And last year, this completely changed. So. Even my neighbors asked me, oh yeah, climate change, so this is an important topic, right? And and that completely shifted. And, and even now in the in Corona times, they say, yeah, but we do not, we, we must not forget about the climate crisis, right? So, and, and that shifted and that is a promising signal. And I think, um, so now even we as scientists have more room to be heard about what's going on and about our our proposals and what i think it's important um related to the second question how, how how to deal with that so we really try to be very close to the policymakers in the sense that we also understand what do they want to know what do they need to know this is related to the political economy question. Um, of course, we can show them a lot of scenarios, but they say, okay, but we have the distributional problem. Then we need answers for that. And so we see it as an iterative process between policymakers and us, uh, where we um, provide answers to, to the newly questions that, that pop up. And I think now you've sort of slightly answered uh, another question from the audience, which is uh, what level of warning will it take for the majority to, of the public to wake up and drive fast policies? Still little reaction, real action globally. And I guess you, you just gave us the example of, of uh, this new initiative, uh, which seems to be wakening people up. But um, I know that the IPCC tried to be alarmists once and that didn't work out too well and then they tried to be more positive and optimistic and that didn't seem to have the, the wanted effect either. So where are we? Where, you know, how, how far away from the midnight uh, hour should we be? Uh, just one observation. I, I think, I mean, it's it's very sad to say that, but um the summer 2018 really changed the debate because um, i live here near berlin and brandenburg it's it's very very dry it never rains and people experience that and when when you talk to to normal people on the street they they say oh yeah this is this is now really climate change and they have the feeling okay now it's there it's, it's very sad because you first have to experience this and and then just take it for for granted in a, in a sense um, but it came to Germany. It's not something that happens in Africa, but it's happening here. And, and um, yeah, this is the first step. So therefore, we have to to take that and say, okay, but we can avoid even worse climate change. So we have to act now. And that's perhaps a good message um, or how to frame it. Yeah, yeah. I agree with Ricky that uh, I think in the last few years uh, things were uh, getting. Uh, more high on the agenda uh, and in that sense it was, it was promising um, at the same time obviously people have other interests as well uh, and uh, and the, many of them are real and um, and so when i at the end of my presentation indicated this uh, importance of lining up with other sustainable development goals 
uh, it was not only because of climate change can have uh, impact on other girls, but it's, it might be also important to make sure that we uh, come up with a strategy that speaks to many system, uh, goals, it speaks up to the development needs of developing countries, it speaks up to the importance of um, also making sure that food security is dealt with and things like that, uh, so, so that it in the end becomes a deal that you can't refuse. Um, so I think that's that's an important step as well. Yeah. Now, dear speakers, although this year's Energy Transition Conference is quite different from the previous ones, uh, having gone virtual, one important aspect of the physical conference still remains, and that is the expert panel. Uh, they operate almost in the form of a thesis defense, uh, which means that the two of you, the two speakers, will be challenged by these experts while you're defending or at least discussing um, your research. Um, are you ready for this? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, the experts that we have with us today are, and now we can see one of them. So the thing is, uh, Toril, you just wait a little bit. Just turn off your camera for a second, please. There you go. So cool. Because the thing is, uh, and this is for the audience out there, um, we have room for six people on screen at the same time, but we have five experts and two speakers and one moderator. So we're going to be a little bit on and off camera now, but these two, uh, I'm trying to point in the direction of the two of you. It's not that easy. There we go. Um, uh, they're going to be present all, all the time. And the experts, I'm just going to say the names and we'll meet them afterwards. They are Volker Krey, who is a professor at both the IIASEA, which is the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, and he's also at the NTNU. Jay Edmonds, Chief Scientist at the Joint Global Change Research Institute. Anders Hammerströmmen, who is a professor at NTNU. Francisca Holz, Deputy Head of Department at DIW Berlin, an adjunct professor at NTNU. And uh, the one we just had a short glimpse of, Toril Nagelhus Harnes, who is Pro Rector at NTNU. Right, so that's the panel. And before I'm going to leave them into the discussion, just a technical um, reminder uh, it takes a little bit of time from um, pushing the buttons for camera and the microphone before they actually get online. So just remember that, don't start talking right away. Now, I would like to invite Jay Edmonds. I can see he is present. Now he can push the button for his camera and his microphone. And I would like him to, to start asking you guys questions. Jay Edmonds, he's one of the pioneer, pioneers in the field of integrated assessment modeling. Of global change and he's currently a researcher at the Joint Global Change Research Institute as I mentioned and I guess Jay you have a couple of questions ready for our two speakers or at least to Detlef isn't that right? Yes, I do. Oh, we, oh there you are good. Can you hear me? Yes. Good um, so uh, there are a couple th th these were two great talks and uh, two great discussions I really enjoyed listening to them. Um, a couple of things that I would like to um, uh, propose back to the, the, the two speakers. Um, one of the, the big developments, and, and, and both the speakers uh, referenced it, uh, has been a more rapid change in technology uh, than had been anticipated a decade ago. Uh, and We've noticed the cost of renewable energy declining uh, much faster than had been anticipated. Uh, we see uh, electric vehicles penetrating the market much faster than anyone had imagined. Uh, we see uh, that we can, as, uh, uh, as, as we've noted, uh, have this conference uh, and I don't have to get on an airplane. Uh, it's made possible by the digital uh, revolution. Uh, and so there are a lot of things uh, that have been going on that have been in a, a positive direction. Uh, and yet uh, and we see this uh, toothless tiger uh, where we have this increasing ambition uh, that uh, governments uh, have uh, taken up uh, and, and while not really following through on uh, all of the, uh, uh, the policies and measures that would be necessary 
uh, to, um, uh, to to actually uh, to uh, reach the goals that they uh, have set. And so, uh, is technology a way for forward uh, in the sense that you know, one uh, should we revisit uh, our sense of, of of what the business as usual really looks like? Uh, and two, is this something that is a policy lever that could be a win-win uh, and could, in fact, make it possible for uh, people around the world uh, to both have faster economic growth, meet uh, many of the uh, SDGs, uh, and, uh, and uh, reduce the, uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases uh, short-lived species and aerosols. So I'd, I'd, I'd really like to hear uh, the, the thoughts of, the, of, of our two speakers. Go ahead, whoever wants okay. to first. I think, it's, I think these are excellent points. And um, the situation is, in that sense, uh, much better than it was 10, 10 years ago, thanks to these uh, technology developments that Jay just mentioned. And, as a result, uh, I, I personally expect that in transport, uh, emissions will decrease um, even uh, despite maybe uh, not having enough policy uh, policies that we would, would like to be there. Um, at the same time, it doesn't mean that there's no need for policies because m most of these technologies, in a sense, developed in a way it's uh, incentivized also by existing policies. And the fact that Germany, for instance, uh, started to uh, have policies for renewables has helped uh, this rapid development of the, uh, of the technologies. So it is still an interaction between, on the one hand, policies, and on the other hand, technology development that can bring us in the right direction. And there are also ways that if you ha wouldn't have the right incentives, the technologies could actually bring us into in, 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 the, in a direction that we wouldn't want to go. And so, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of uh, expectations with respect to the renewables, electricity vehicles, digitalization, but we need to combine it uh, with the right policies. Uh, at the positive side, uh, and I saw somewhat one question also on Slido on this, I do think that the chances of being really, really high in emissions have come down over time, yes, as a result of this. Yeah, I would like to, to add uh, one or two points. Um, so definitely, I, I would agree with you that um, technologies, this is what we need and this is the important point. And um, we also see in the corona crisis, uh, crisis in a sense that lifestyle changes alone will not do the job. And the reason is what we currently see with the emissions dropping because of the corona crisis, we will see a drop of five to six or seven percent this year in emissions. Um, and, and you could say these are kind of lifestyle changes because some countries live in a lockdown. But this is even not enough to achieve 1.5 degrees. We would need this every year. And, and so even this is not enough. Um, so therefore, um, we need much more than just lifestyle changes in a sense. So we need a, um, a transition or you called it an, a structural change. So therefore, technologies will play a very huge role in, in my opinion. But on the, on, on the other side, you say renewables are cheap and also that I've said this. I mean, we, we also have to be a little bit careful because in many countries, the capital costs for renewables are much higher. When you are a poor country and want to invest in renewables, the capital costs are quite high. Um, so therefore, just to have um, low prices for renewables as a technology is not enough. We also need to, to fix the capital markets in a, in a sense, and so that investments into renewables are, <clears throat> sorry, are supported also uh, by, by capital markets. Jay, are you uh, satisfied with these answers? I think they're very insightful answers, yes. Good. So I'm going to keep you there, uh, but I'm going to invite the next uh, expert from, from the panel. And uh, so thank you very much, Jay, so far. And uh, once we've had all the experts asking their first initial questions, I'm going to pull out of it and just leave all of you talk together. So uh, we're going to move over to Fofi Play.
um, you're also a cap capacity in the field of integrated assessment models. And what kind of challenging questions have you prepared for our two speakers, I wonder? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you uh, for, for having me here and also for the for the two very nice uh, presentations. I have uh, selected from a long list of, uh, of points uh, that I put down uh, during the presentations, uh, a couple, one kind of motivated by Detlef and one by Brigitte's talk. Um, uh, Detlef had specifically highlighted that, um, that some measures that could be uh, very much helping um, to address the mitig mitigation challenge relate to behavioral change. You, you mentioned specifically um, switching to healthy diets, not necessarily very vegetarian. We know that adopting healthy diets is more likely um, for, for people with higher education. So, um, and I, th I think there are many of these linkages where broader development issues, education is probably a, a good example, uh, increase coping capacity and this holds both for um, resilience to, to climate change that we will have and experience no matter what um, but also in terms of um, adapting to the challenges uh, in mitigation so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering are we too little as a research, uh, research community emphasizing the need to complement specific mitigation focused measures with kind of broad development objectives which have really um, benefits across the board right i think education will also help help people to cope with the current uh, covid uh, crisis so uh, that's one and then i had um one question more focused to Brigitte, but i, I think it's uh, equally valid for, uh, to, to both of you Brigitte had uh, very nicely emphasized that if we look at current policy instruments that are not necessarily put in place uh, as a mitigation measure, like um, um, fuel taxes, mineral oil taxes in the transport sector are a nice example, um, that if one interprets these as uh, implicit carbon prices, um, they are not insignificant. I, I would actually argue that you've underemphasized that. I mean, if you translate European level uh, mineral oil taxes into equivalent carbon prices. Uh, Germany is in the range of $200 or two, more than $200 per ton CO2. No Norwegian taxes, I think more in the range of 500. Um, we all know that this is by far not enough to, to trigger the transformation in the transport sector. So which begs the question, do we need to accept that uniform carbon prices are not uh, are not the way to go simply because you need very different levels uh, in, in different sectors. In agriculture, for example, you may want to take it a little bit more slowly because this affects, uh, may affect food security. Yeah. Now he's stopped for me, but I think yeah, I think Sophia has had a tiny problem with uh, the sound. I think the transmission uh, is not 100% uh, stable. Um, did you get to finish your question for Brigitte? Do, do you have enough to, to give him a reply, Brigitte? Or, yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So um, then I think, Detlef, uh, would you like to answer first, since the first question was for you, and then Brigitte goes on, and I think now Volker is back as well. Ah, yeah, I, could, I couldn't unmute myself. I was muted by the organizer. Um, yeah, um, I think it's an excellent point about education. And um, uh, one other reason that you didn't even mention, Volker, was uh, there's a, we know that from research there's a strong relationship between education and fertility levels uh, and therefore population growth. And that's another important uh, element in the room that normally is not really discussed a lot. But obviously has a big impact uh, on the mitigation challenge, uh, and so I think we, I think it's very good that you brought it up, uh, and we tend normally not to highlight it as a mitigation measure in, in IPCC reports. You would not uh, find it, uh, and you would find your efficiency improvement, you would your your supply side uh, technologies, uh, maybe some remarks on lifestyle. Um, 
but I I I hundred percent agree with you that um, it, it might we might want to uh, emphasize it more. Um, you also re you mentioned it in relationship to healthy diets, um, and I and therefore I also see what you mentioned. At the same time, I also think that once um, some uh, parts of society start to change their lifestyle, you see it that uh, adopted by other parts. And so, as for instance, we saw with smoking behavior uh, that uh, uh, that also seemed to be a quite difficult transition, but now easily it. Um, got adopted that people don't smoke in restaurants and so if, if a group starts to do it apparently and you have you need some champions and people uh, might follow so thanks for the question we can't hear Brietta now so you have to start over again so you will be unmuted i hope I think you can hear me now, right? Great. Yeah, thank you, Volker, for, for this question. I, I think um, I have to give a little bit com complex answer to that. Um, so first of all, um, with this text on, on mineral oil, um, the first important point is that they are not taken for environmental reasons, right? And this is important to emphasize because they are taken for infrastructure reasons, for example, for building roads and so on. Um, Second point is a lot of people um, argue, well, let's see, there are already, we, we already have a kind of implicit um, carbon price of 250 euro and nothing happens, right? People still drive. But the point is that um, we know from empirical exercises that the announcement of a tax has a much stronger effect, for example, uh, than the, the daily um, differences in the gasoline prices from gasoline stations, right? So if you announce a tax, um, it has a higher impact than just this implicit um, um, price fluctuations over the day. Um, so therefore, um, I, I would still say that a carbon tax has an effect also in the transport sector. The third point is what you say, do we need differentiated prices for the different sectors? So a different price for the electricity sector, for the transport sector, and for the heating sector. And this is a crucial point. And we have debated this a lot also in, in, in Germany last year. And I'm I'm still not um I, I don't have a full um full answer to that. Um the, the point is, um, from an economic efficiency point, you would also always argue for one uniform price. But I think people who say, well, if we have a uniform price, then everything will be done in, in the electricity sector and nothing happens in, in the transport sector, they are right, right? So if we would increase prices in the electricity, prices, uh, in the electricity sector, we would see, for example, in Germany, a very quick phase out of coal. And um, so this is again related to this political economy question. So which sector do you want to um, protect or where do you want to see a more um, 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 ambitious um, transition? I, I would again argue with the perspective towards 2030. I would say we need a uniform price signal across all sectors. But for the starting point, I would also argue for different prices in the heating and transport sector um, compared, for example, to, to the um, electricity sector. Thank you, Brigitte. Um, Volker, are you content? Did they answer you in a good way? You're muted, but I could see you, you, you were saying yes. <laughs> I was saying yes, obviously room for discussing this another half hour. Yeah, which we don't have because we have more experts in our panel that I'm going to introduce. So thank you so far to Volker and you're still going to stay with us on camera. Now, Anders Hammerströmann, professor at NTNU. Um, his main focus is on the application of, and development of life cycle assessments. So there's a slightly different perspective. I can see him, he's sitting Oh, that looks very cozy, Anders. You're sitting next to the <laughs> fireplace and everything. Uh, I guess it's not that warm in, in Trondheim at the moment. No. So, <laughs> what kind of challenging questions do you have from your living room, I guess it is? Give it a go. Yes. 
So um, thanks for a very interesting presentation so far and good questions. I was thinking to try to um, uh, uh, go a bit in uh, into some of the more practicalities regarding the transition. And obviously, uh, we've talked about the challenges of what sectors will we be phasing out, which will we be keeping, but evidently there will also be new ones. Um, and we talked about electrification and the emergence and, and the, uh, of a growing uh, battery industry is something we will have to um, uh, deal sensibly with. It's a sector that has its sustainability challenges, so we can go a bit broader, not just climate change, but also sustainable development goals, uh, broadly speaking. And um, uh, we talk about beyond climate, obviously resources, uh, child labor, uh, and a quite a broad plethora of, of challenges that we, we should be addressing. So I was thinking um, to you, Detlef, uh, what would you say the integrated assessment modeling community has to offer in terms of providing guidance uh, for how we should be, um, or how we may be, um, be guiding the development of that sector going forward, ensuring uh, we understand the right metrics with, res uh, with respect to sustainable, you know, a sustainable development of, of that sector. And then to be it, uh, do we do we have the policies in place to to guide that? Uh, are those sufficient, or are we in need of more policies to to ensure that the new, uh, in generally speaking, the battery sector as an example, but the emerging sectors? How do we deal with those uh, those that will provide the green transition that we will have to rely on for a future sustainable society. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Anders, for that question. Um, yeah, so, interestingly, uh, so what the integrated assessment community can do is to uh, give this uh, large-scale uh, indications of directions and the role of um, electrification. Um, I said interesting because I think here we could also collaborate a lot uh, with the LCA uh, community because they can fill in much of the details on the issues that you were uh, now referring to, for instance, and the consequences for metal demand, um, maybe other indicators that are related to specifically the production of these batteries. And so while with the integrated assessment models, we could try to scale to show what kind of role there would be for electrification. Uh, we could then link that information with LCA to, to explore some of these consequences and show what are real challenges. And there are some of them, there are real challenges and what are missed. And so for instance, also indications that the energy demand for producing these batteries would be enormous and that therefore we wouldn't be going in the right direction. Or for instance, the electricity that is produced would not be green. And we can challenge those myths because that's to some degree a myth and we can show that. Uh, but um, at the same time, we could also show, like this analogy with, with the maps before, some of the, the real challenges and, and see whether they, they can be handled. So I think it's a nice area where, where we could might maybe even work together on this. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Very good point. And, um, I would say this also shows the limits of carbon pricing, right? Because here carbon pricing is definitely not the answer for a, for a proper measure. Um, because um, when, when you have an emerging technology or so, um, to, to my opinion, a carbon price is not the right instrument to steer that, right? So carbon price is good when we have different technologies available and uh, we can choose the, the one that uh, has the lowest uh, CO2 content. Um, and also, always when, when infrastructure is in, involved, then also a carbon price is not very useful. For example, when we think of um, battery, this is not to produce the batteries, but uh, charging um, infrastructure for electric vehicles, for example. So therefore, what are the right measures for the emerging sectors? Actually, I have no answer to that. I mean, they can tell you the buzzwords like R&D and pilot plans and so on, but but this is not really a full-fledged concept. And I think it's very important uh, what what you say. So not to forget, let let's um, say the the emerging sectors and also how digitalization um, can um, 
can facilitate the energy transition. But I have no um, concrete measures for, for batteries or also. Are you satisfied on this? Yeah, I think it was very, very interesting. As, as Folke said, this is obviously a topic to be discussed. Uh, uh, we could discuss for a long time. And of course, we should not forget that um, this is the first of five webinars regarding the energy transition. So we will have ample time to discuss in more detail as we go along as well. So we're going to talk about it a bit later on. Now, I'm soon going to upset myself visually. I'm actually going to do that right away in order to give room for, because I, th I think you can still hear me, but I'm going to give room for Francisca Holz. And as Deputy Head of Department at the DIW Berlin, she is coordinating the research area, resource and environmental markets in the department, energy, transportation and environment. Environment, sorry. And I guess you too, Francisca, has some have some questions ready for our speakers. And I'm curious, did you share all of Digita's perspectives when she was speaking? Um, many, yes, <laughs> but I would like to compliment them a little bit. I think uh, she was focusing on one policy that was very important for Germany last year, but there's another one uh, that she mentioned only very briefly, that's the coal phase out. And in my work, I focus very much on, on fossil fuel energies, on coal, but also oil and gas. So I think those um, sort of more sectoral perspectives are also very important if we talk about how to relieve our climate crisis. Uh, we need to do something to tackle our emissions from using those fossil fuels. Um, and it's, as we've seen in the last year, it's not just a carbon price and uh, it's very unlikely to have the global carbon price very soon. So uh, what we've rather seen in the last years in Germany is probably one example is that a very specific region specific, uh, sector specific policies can rather help us um, reducing the role of fossil fuels. Um, so there's sort of a mix of uh, demand side policies, uh, as we would call it, and, and also supply side policies that can help um, reducing um, the emissions from the fossil fuel sector. And I think it's really important to also to sort of work with that mix um, of supply and, and uh, demand side. Uh, demand side is probably something like uh, uh, like what we've just discussed, uh, um, uh, improving technologies, finding something like uh, electric vehicles, um, or also in, in the industrial sector, which we haven't touched upon at all yet, um, something like electric steel instead of uh, co uh, coking coal intensive steel uh, will be uh, measures that can help us reducing our emissions. Um, what I find even more interesting, because it's probably even more challenging, is the supply side measures um, that relates closely to what Brigitte called the political economy. Uh, so basically bringing in the suppliers of fossil fuels, both the companies and also the countries uh, to um, commit to climate policies and to commit to the Paris targets. Um, and that is, that is a huge challenge. I mean, that would mean for countries like Norway, but also Russia, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. So um, countries and companies that earn their revenues from fossil fuels to uh, probably forego a lot of revenues. Um, and we need measures, we need ideas to convince them that it's also in their long time, long term interest uh, to do that. Um, and that is probably a question that I would have to uh, the two speakers. Do you have ideas for that? In particular, if I may sort of bring that to the current situation, um, we see outside of Europe, uh, people are not talking about a green recovery, uh, but people are talking about any recovery. And just in North America, also a developed and wealthy country. People are talking about um, recovery programs for the oil sector, the fossil fuel sector. How can that be? I mean, that's really um, showing how big the challenge is, right? It's not just the developing world that is betting on coal. Um, that is uh, really a big challenge to, to make a, to make the region green. It's also other developing countries that are um, uh, dependent on, on fossil fuels and fossil fuel revenues. So it's a challenge in the short term and of course that goes on in the long term um, and let me just mention that I think for um, us as Germans this perspective of um, well if you don't have a global action uh, then let's at least start with um, doing or giving a positive example and start uh, by uh, trying a national policy that's probably something that we can also sort of bring as a message to to other regions so we have after long discussions, of course, uh, uh, decided uh, on a coal phase out uh, last year. And um, we, did, we didn't do that on out of the blue, but we looked at other countries that had already done a coal phase out, like for example, the UK, um, Spain, Denmark. There are other examples of, of course, smaller coal countries, but there were other examples. And we took 
some of their lessons learned, like um, the need to bring in the communities of the miners, to, to bring in other stakeholders like um, the trade unions. Um, and uh, so we decided to do out of those lessons learned from other countries to do a very broad, um, inclusive process uh, to find a, a compromise on, on the coal phase out. And that is sort of one step in the learning of how we can actually find policies that are adapted to the, the national, the regional context, and also the sectoral context. And I think this is a way of finding a solution to the political economy challenge. So my question to uh, Brigitte and Detlef, uh, both of you basically is, um, well, what can you sort of, what are ideas that you would uh, suggest to, how can we bring those fossil fuel suppliers on board? Who would like to go first, Brigitte? <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, thank you very much. It a lot of food for thought. Um, to my opinion, um, you asked the question how to bring companies to commit to the Paris targets, right? And for me, this is kind of a it's it's kind of a wrong question because you you ask them um, how to do that individually in a sense. And how can they do it? Because companies, I mean, they have to um, have the, the highest profit. And in these times, still, it gives you the highest profit when you have fossil fuel investments, but perhaps not long-term investment, but at least in the, in the short and medium term, this gives you the highest revenues and, and, and the highest um, rate of return. So therefore, to ask them, well, please forgo some of your um, of, of your money to to invest into renewables i think this somehow this is not how the economy is working so therefore I, I think governments should give a framework where companies could do that right so therefore i very much support um these different um calls by by um fossil fuel companies by a lot of um, other big companies who call on the governments please give carbon a price, please tax us, right? So or please tax CO2. And, and this is very useful. And so therefore, I, I, I do not see that, that companies should do that by themselves and, and be the front runner because um, they, they will probably not be successful in the current economic environment, but they should go to the governments. And uh, what, what we learned is that in, in Germany, we had a um, um, <clears throat> kind of connection to the uh, industry people, um, in industry association, they are very, very, very strong in Germany, right? They have uh, the largest say. And um, we we had a kind of joint uh, effort with them um, to implement carbon pricing at the G20 level. And the chancellor's office, they said, well, it's so important that the industry is behind that. So, where can we, so this gives us um, the, the reason why we can move forward. That was in the G20 uh, during the G20 presidency of, of Germany. So therefore, I, I, I would say the strongest uh, thing they could do is go to the government and ask for a high tax on carbon. Um, yeah, and on the coal phase out, actually, I have a different per uh, perception on that, and we could talk uh, about that even more than half an hour. I would say, yes, it was an inclusive process, but it, I, I wouldn't say it's a blueprint for, for other countries, so therefore I, I, I didn't mention that one. Thank you, Brigitte. So, Detlef, do you have a short comment here? Yeah, just just a few very quick points because I, I agree with what Francisca said and also with some of uh, the answers of Brigitte. Uh, that um, so it's important to ensure that there's a, uh, the right governance uh, structure and these transitions need to be fast, but they also need to be just, and they're, they're probably only fast if they are just. Uh, and um, one thing that at some point I, I that we saw start happening, but then totally didn't continue, was that some of the oil companies decided that they were energy companies. And um, so companies like BP and Shell uh, at some point started to invest themselves in, into uh, renewables and make big... So that was happening at some point and then uh, at, when the prices changed and the fossil fuels became more attractive again, they decided that they wanted to focus more on their own mainstream area. I'm not sure whether that is going to happen again and um, whether, for instance, Shell might decide that it is an energy company and therefore maybe oil is not necessarily their big business, but they could side up 
with uh, some of the renewables. It almost happened last year in the Netherlands, uh, where Shell was trying to buy up by an electricity company, uh, and uh, and that would make things in this particular case more easier because they have, would have an interest on both sides of the cake. Good. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was actually a little bit anxious about the time that we would have too much time, but now I see we're running out of time. So, so it's the contrary, and um, we're we're actually uh, closing up to um, one o'clock. But I think we, we we can we can sort of let go on a little bit longer because we have a fifth expert, and now we have to wave goodbye to Jay uh, and give room to um, Toril Harnes, who is the pro rector at the end. And you, and she's the prorector for innovation. And I know that she has some questions too, ready for the speakers. But before she gets the chance to ask anything, I would like to ask her. Uh, now, Toril, your rector and board, she emphasised in her welcome speech the importance of energy research done at NTNU and other institutions as well with energy as a catalyst for societal development. And that is a huge responsibility. Today, it has all been about a world in crisis. Now, where do you see the energy research community's role in the years to come in accelerating the necessary transitions towards the thing we're talking about, the sustainable society? In short, please. Thank you, Ruth. It's not easy to be short in that questions, but Anyway, first, thanks. I would like to just express a thanks to Professor Aske Sørensen, Thomas Gård, who actually made this uh, seminar possible because I've been listening to, to the discussions and I also find that the answers and at Slido, the questions there are very, very interesting and important. And uh, just to answer your question, Ruth, uh, I think that the research environment at the universities and at the research institute all over the world will be more and more important in the future because we need new knowledge, we need new competence and we also need new solutions. So what we as universities and what the research environment and people can actually bring into the discussions and into uh, also for the industry and the public sector will increase uh, in the future, I believe. Oh. And that is also something that I want to address to the, the presenters here. Thank you very much, both of you, for very interesting presentations. And my questions, listening to you about the models, the political economy, and what I uh, really is very, um, you know, interesting in is the, the, the role of the universities, not only of the research environment, but the universities in the future and in how we can make a different difference regarding all the challenges that we are now facing. We see that the youth uh, and the younger people are very interested in and they are also very, you know, have clear opinions on uh, the climate change and what we should do. Therefore, I also believe that the educational part of our missions is important. So I want to challenge you a little bit because I, I haven't heard a word of that today. So do you see a change in the university's role how we the world will face the climate change in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Torel. Who wants to go first? I can see that you're smiling, both of you. <laughs> yeah, actually, because concerning German universities, I'm not very convinced that they will solve any problem of the climate crisis actually because i think it's more the the independent institutes and the think tanks who who push this um, agenda forward and who also provide um the the detailed knowledge that the policymakers need because at, in germany just for the german case um most of the the research that, that comes from germany is not adapted to the policymakers need 
So therefore, I think we, we need a kind of bridge then between universities and, and policymakers. But where I agree with you that we have very bright and very interested young people who want to work on the climate issue. And I agree very much with that. And Francisca, she also has a, a with a DIW where a lot of um, students are. And um, what is important for them is the interdisciplinary perspective. So before, in, in Germany, the universities are very tied to their own perspective. It's physics and here is economics and there is another discipline. And, and this is what the think tanks and the and the research institutes in, in Germany do differently. They, they provide an interdisciplinary approach and interdisciplinary perspective. Um, and, and I think this is important on, also for the young students. Yeah, this is my perspective on, on, on that question. Thank okay, you. Thanks. I'm, I'm actually uh, working at both a government uh, institute, uh, PDL, Netherlands Climate Assessment Agency, but also a professor at the uh, Utrecht University at a uh, research uh, institute called Copernicus, which is an interdisciplinary uh, research institute. So I, I, I do believe uh, universities uh, should play a, an important role. I think the uh, issue ra raised by Brigitte, how to make sure that um, uh, university research uh, is also used in the best way is an important uh, topic both on the supply side and demand side so and how can uh, the users see what is happening at the universities and how do the universities make sure that it's not only very interesting research but it also communicated in a well that in a way that is uh, the message is picked up and we are we are experimenting and i guess all the countries are, are but we are for instance organizing now every year these um, um, places where we bring young PhD students to policymakers and have this half-day session uh, to, to to organize this interaction. I I think the universities need to play a role in many ways uh, in awareness raising, uh, in innovation, and building these new technologies that, uh, for instance, Jay was also uh, discussing earlier, uh, but also in the, uh, the, the issues that Francisca was raising in implementation, how, how to make sure that these propositions that seem to be attractive in a model can be really implemented in a real world and how do we ensure that the interests of people are, are aligned much more. And I think um, new research in these areas uh, will be critically important. And, um, I, I, therefore, I think it's important that this is done better and, and more at universities. And, and my, my last uh, word is that uh, yeah, with these models we can make these big pictures, uh, but uh, we, we now know, we know that in implementation is actually much more in the, in the details and so somehow these big pictures might be inspiring for people to uh, see where they want to focus their research, but on the other hand at, at some point it's also important that what we learn there is brought back in some to some degree into these models and, and, and the scenarios. Thank you, Detlef. Uh, so, Toril, are you satisfied? Uh, so, in Germany, well, there's a lack of a bridge somehow. <laughs> Whereas, uh, yeah, what do you think? I just I can comment. I think I'm satisfied with the answers, but I think that the universities could even be challenged more to to contribute both to a more knowledge based debate as well as making uh, more um, important uh, results based on the research and also to implement the res results from research into you know specific solutions for making better uh, climate in the future. Good. So that kind of sums it all up. And uh, before I'm uh, saying thank you to everyone, I just want to inform you that the presentations made by Brigitte and Detlev are available and downloadable from the handout tab. I suspect everyone should be um, should have that uh, in their uh, login. Um, and if you don't, please get in touch with the um, 
with the uh, energy transition um, uh, secretariat and they can help you out. So I would like to thank all of you, uh, the two speakers and the five experts in the panel and not to least the audience for participating today and asking good questions, relevant questions. It's been very interesting listening to all of you and I'm going to invite Oscar Thomas Gar to join me just for a last final remark and I'm going to put my camera back on and Oscar are you with me can't see you yet but hopefully there you are okay hello again now Oscar uh, this was the first webinar in the series of five and um, it was a rather gloomy picture that we were painting out today but hopefully the next the next four uh, ones will be slightly more optimistic or at least solution driven maybe uh, i think this was a, was a good webinar to set the scene for the sustainable actions that need to come and i think it was demonstrated very well that this sustainable action needs to be accelerated in the years to come and uh, the two next seminars in uh, webinars in the in in line is in fact one called game changers which are needed and then we will have one on uh, is there a future for fossil energy in this setting? And, and that future will probably involve CCS or alternative use of petroleum resources. But that's what we're going to debate in, in the two next webinars coming up. Good, yeah, because we've we've run out of time. We're already seven minutes uh, overdue. So I think we should probably just say thank you for today. And uh, where can people be informed of the dates for the next webinars? Uh, everyone that registered for this one will be invited into the webinars. In addition, we will publish uh, the full webinar programs on the website of the Energy Transition Initiative and, of course, advertise it on LinkedIn and Facebook. Very, very good. So we should say goodbye and see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks.